Welcome history enthusiasts and casual time travelers alike. Buck up for a whirlwind tour through the nows of ancient history where gods throw tantrums, empires rise and fall, and a guy named Joshua changes the world. Yes, you heard that right, Joshua. From the melodramatic peaks of Mount Olympus to the humble hills of Nazareth, I'm diving deep into the stories that shaped civilizations and gave us some of the best plot twists long before Netflix was a thing. Ever wondered how a swan-loving Zeus and the carpenter from Nazareth could possibly be connected, or why Greek philosophy matters when you're scrolling through your memes. I'm unpacking it all, mixing humor with history to breathe life into those dusty old tales. So whether you're here to finally grasp the significances of Plato's cave, or just chuckle at emperors with more titles than sense, you've come to the right place. Prepare for a journey that starts with a chaotic family drama of Greek pantheon. Uh, meanders through the not-so-golden sequel of Hellenistic Greece, gets entangled in Rome's world domination plans, and lands smack dab in the middle of a tiny land with a colossal backstory, Israel. Along the way, you will meet philosophers who were the original influencers, uh, emperors with PR skills that will make modern marketers jealous, and a resilient people whose story have echoed through millennia. So grab your toga, dust off your sandals, and let's get sail on this comedic cruise through antiquity. Trust me, history has never been this entertaining or this enlightening. Greek beginnings from Zeus's family drama to Joshua, the anointed one, which is Jesus Christ. Why kick out our story in the ancient Greece instead of the cozy barn of Bethlehem filled with hay, a couple of goats, and some very confused shepherds? Well, because it is the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word, excuse me, and that word was Greek. Literally, John's gospel skips the nativity scene and jumps straight into a philosophical monologue where word translates to the Greek term logos. Now, logos isn't just your average word. It's a Swiss army knife of ancient terminology. It means word, reason, story, conversation, rumor, and possibly the thing that you mutter when you stub your toe. John tells us that the Logos was God, then casually mentions it become human, moved into the neighborhood, full of grace, truth, and perhaps a fondness of feta cheese. Greek joke. Then there's Jesus Christ. Spoiler, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. It's from the Greek Christos, meaning anointed one. His original name was Yeshua. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. It's in Hebrew, which is word Joshua in English to, for today. So yes, the center figure of Christianity could have been known as Josh the Anointed, a name that would have certainly give church services a more casual vibe probably. But why all the Greek in the story about Jewish carpenter? Well, Jesus grew up in Nazareth, a town so small and Jewish that the local gossip probably centered around who didn't show up at synagogue. Yet Greek culture was the ancient world's version of Wi-Fi. It was everywhere and everyone was connected. Early Christians needed to spread the message far and wide so when they went with Greek, the language, the universal language of the time, much like the airline safety announcements and pop-up song, pop songs. Um, the mess, I'm not sure if I'm announcing this right, but the, we're moving on now to the messianic Marvel and the mysterious Dark Age of that time. Let's start with the machines back a couple of millennia, pictured mountainous peninsulas, islands galore, and people who looked at the hills and thought, challenge accepted, let's build a city on top of that. Around 1400 BCE, some groups got wealthy enough to construct a monumental palace, fortifications, and tombs. The ancient equivalent of building a mansion with a really big fence and an elaborate family mausoleum. The big player was Masina. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, I apologize. A city so fortified that even with its walls had walls. Think of it as an ancient world's gated community. Masion was the center of empire that even took over Crete, home of the Minotaur and the mythological oddities. But around 1200 BCE, something went cat catastrophical wrong. Was it an earthquake, invasion, someone forgot to sacrifice a goat to the right god? We don't know. The historians call this the late Bronze Age collapse, which is an academic uh, speak for your guess is as good as mine. 
This led to the term a dark age, a few centuries where things went so downhill that people forgot how to write. Imagine losing your Wi-Fi password and being not being able to reset it for 300 years. Next, moving on to Homer, the original epic content creator. Enter Homer, not Simpson, but the OG storyteller. He took these ancient tales that spun the Iliad and the Odyssey, epics that became the classical equivalent of Netflix hits that have been inspiring adaptations and ruining high school students' GPs ever since. Homer's works focus on the Trojan War, a conflict probably based on some real skirmish, but embellished with enough gods, heroes, and drama to make Game of Thrones look like a documentary. The Greeks besieged Troy because Paris, a Trojan prince, stole Helen, um, the most beautiful woman in the world. Talk about overreacting a, to a life triangle. Greek unity and not so tr uh, United States. Despite their common language, love for stories involving wooden horses, the Greeks were not ever big on centralized government. They preferred city-states or polis, which is plural for polis, polis which po I'm, I'm not pronouncing some of these words right, I apologize, but polis was an, a separate country uh, with its own laws, customs, and favorite local deities. Imagine if every U.S. state was not had its own government, but it was our own pantheon of gods and considered itself a sovereign nation. The Olympics were one of the few times that they together got together peacefully, probably because they enjoyed watching athletes compete in the nude, which they actually did compete in the nude. Yes, you heard that right. <laughs> the original Olympics were less about gold medals and probably more about avoiding awkward timelines. Um, next, we're moving on to gods behaving badly. Greek religion, and this is all being connected to Christianity and Judaism and how, why Greek is influencing this New Testament type thing. But Greek religion was, let's say, complicated. The gods were just functional family that made reality TV look tame. Zeus was the king of gods, had a penchant for turning into animals to woo, uh, or abduct various women, swan, bull, golden shower, don't ask. <laughs> but Hera, his wife, spent most of the time plotting revenge on the lovers and illegitimate offspring. It was like an episode of Keeping Up with the Olympians. In contrast, the Jewish God was more about mysterious one-liners and dramatic appearances. When Moses asked for his name, God replied, I am who I am, which is either deeply profound or the original mic drop. Philosophers, the original think influencers, faced with the uh, capricious gods and the responsibility of self-governance in their polis. The Greeks turned into philosophy, the love of wisdom, and their Socrates, who wandered around Athens questioning everything and everyone, making him the ancient equivalent of that friend who always plays devil advocate. His method involved asking a series of questions to real contradictions in people's thoughts, a technique now used by parents worldwide to catch a teenager in a lie. Unfortunately, Athens didn't appreciate his methods. He was sentenced to death for corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods. He was forced to drink Hamlet, uh, proving that being the smartest guy in the room isn't always the safest career path. Plato, Socrates' student, wrote dialogues featuring the mentor and introduced the uh, concept of ideal forms. According to Plato, everything we see is just a shadow of his perfect version somehow, somewhere, I'm sorry, in a non-philosophical realm. Think of it as the ultimate expectation versus reality meme. Then there's Aristotle's Plato's student who decided that best way to understand the world was to categorize everything if it existed. Aristotle wanted to observe it, name it, and file it away in some giant mental Rolodex. He wrote on physics, biology, politics, ethics, you name it. His works became so influential that the centuries later, medieval scholars treated his writings like gospel. Need to, need to settle a debate? Just pull out Aristotle says and watch everyone not in agreement. The birth of democracy also spun from Greek some terms, conditions apply. But the, the Greeks' most significant contributions is democracy. Government by the people, for the people, at least some of the people. In Athens, democracy meant 
Male citizens over 18 could participate in assembly. But let's break that down. Male excluded women, citizens excluded slaves and foreigners, and over 18 excluded youth who were probably too busy anyway. So in reality, a small fraction of the population had a say in government, which is still better than none, but let's not start handing out participation trophies. Despite its flaws, Athian democracy was revolutionary. Citizens could vote on laws, policies, and even ostracize someone for popular vote, a practice that might make modern politicians break out in a cold sweat. The historians of Herodotus and Thysolithus Butchering is a lot of these names, I'm really sorry, it's hard to pronounce. The history is a couple. The Greeks also invented history as a field of study. Uh, Herodotus, often called the father of history, traveled extensively to gather stories about different cultures, um, wars, and bizarre customs. His works include everything from accounts of giant ants to the co collect gold to the tales of heroic battles. Some called him the father of lies. But hey, who does embellish a little? Then there's Thysidius, who I might pronounce it different earlier, but I'm talking about the same guy with the T word for his for first name, who took a more serious approach. He wrote about the, uh, the Pelagian, I'm not going to pronounce this right, Peloponnesian, Peloponnesian, nope, it's not Peloponnesian. It is the P L O P O N. Yeah, it may, it may, it may be pop. No, it's not. I'm fucking this video up now. The Plopligian War. <laughs> I will hopefully do better in future videos with pronunciation of words. Uh, between Athens and Sparta, a conflict that lasted 27 years and ended the Athens to the long losing side. Thyatidas focused on factual accuracy and the human causes of events, ignoring the gods and mythical creatures. He might be the original, just the facts journalist. Drama queens and kings, now we're going on to. Greek theater was another outlet for exploring human experience. Playwrights like Astagoras, sorry, Spoclus, Euripides, wrote tragedies that delved, didn't pronounce any of them right, I'm sure, that delved into themes of fate, justice, and wrath of gods. Their plays featured characters making terrible decisions, suffering the consequences, a genre we now call, a genre we now call drama on Monday. On the flip side, Aristocephus, <laughs> don't know how to pronounce that, wrote com com comedies, that saturated Athenian society, politics, and even other playwrights. His plays were filled with witty dialogue, slapstick humor, and enough innuendos to make a modern sitcom writer blush. From Polius to Politics. Now we're going on to. The concept of Polius was central to Greek identity. It wasn't just a city, it was a community, a way of life. The term gives us words like politics and policy. Each polis was fiercely independent, which sometimes led to conflicts, but also fostered a sense of belonging and responsibility among the citizens. When early Christians were organizing their communities, they borrowed the Greek term ecclesia, meaning assembly, which we now translate as church. Just as citizens participated in ecclesia of their own polis, Christians gathered in their own assemblies to worship and make decisions. Now the Greek legacy and Christianity. The Greeks laid the intellectual groundwork that would later shape Christian theology. Philosophers like Plato and Aristotle provide a framework for discussing ethics, metaphysics, and the nature of the divine. Early Christian thinkers used these philosophies to explain their beliefs to predominantly Greek-speaking world. Plato's emphasis on a higher realm of perfect forms resonated with the Christian idea of heaven. Aristotle's method of categorizing and analyzing the natural world influenced how medieval scholars approached theology and science. It's like Greeks provided the software, and the Christians wrote the new code on top of it. Conclusion, why start in Greece? So starting our story in Greece isn't just about acknowledging the word, logos, 
but recognizing the Greeks gave the word a language, a philosophical context and a cultural vehicle to spread across the world. Without the Greeks, we might have not known democracy, drama, history, philosophy, or the Olympics, though some might have missed the last one. In the end, the Greeks were the original influencers spreading ideas, culture, and occasionally myths and gold-digging ants. Their legacy is so entwined with Western civilization that skipping that would be like watching a movie sequel without seeing the original. Sure, you might get the gist, but you might have missed out the backstory, the character development, and the inside jokes. So here's to the Greeks, trailblazers of thought, lovers of wisdom, and pioneers of the awkward tradition of public nudity in sports. They didn't just lay the foundation, they built the entire first floor and handed it the, us the keys. Now it's up to us to decide what cu curtains to hang. Now we're moving on to the Hellenistic Greece, Hellenistic Greece, when Greece got a sequel and it wasn't as good as the original. If I said this, had his own time traveling crystal ball, the guy we talked about earlier, earlier, which I might be pronouncing different ways each time, or maybe had a pessimistic friend named Cassandra, he might have looked of the 4th century Greeks and said, you know what, we totally deserve what's coming. The Greeks were so busy squabbling over whose city-state had the best philosophy department and whose states had the most abs, they didn't notice the northern neighbors. The Macedonians eyeing the sm snack. Enter King Philip II of Macedon, the guy who looked at the distinguished, I'm sorry, King Philip II of Macedon, he uh, looked at the Greek city states and thought, I could unify that or at least conquer it. In 338 BCE, he launched the Unite Greece Under Me campaign, culminating in the Battle of the Trinia. It was a close run but decisive victory when Philip essentially said, checkmate, and the Greeks collectively face pop, pl plan. Yeah, face, whatever. They, but wait, there's more. Philip's personal life was spicier than a plate of jalapenos. His entanglements in romantic liaisons, let's just say his love life, was less than family tree and more family tumbleweed, led to his assassination by a bodyguard who was caught in the complicated web. So propers have nothing on ancient Macedonia court drama. The sudden vacancy on the throne paved the way for Philip's 20-year-old son, Alexander III, to step up. You might have known him as Alexander the Great because you're the ambitious, the okay, just doesn't cut it. Alexander took his dad's expansion dreams and said, hold on to my wine goblet. He went on a conquest spree that overwhelmed the Persian Empire and Egypt, and he just just up until northern India, all before turning 32. Meanwhile, most of us are still trying to figure out how to fold a fitted sheet, like me, by myself, at 34. <laughs> um, anyway, so Alexander sure brought destruction and misery to vast regions, details details, but he achieved more lasting significance than your average megalomaniac person, megalomaniac person. He and his father were such a big fan of Greek culture that they didn't just adopt it, they binge watched it, bought the merch, and started speaking in quotes. They embraced Greek modes of life and social norms, including the open acceptance and same-sex relationships, which was quite standard in Greek society. Alexander just didn't conquer lands. He transformed cultures. He spread Greek thought and customs throughout the Near East and Egypt, influencing everything from architecture to philosophy. His em imperial style was so chic, chic that the future of imperial fashionistas, the Romans, were like, I'll have what he's having and modeled their empire accordingly. But as anyone who ever played Jenga knows, Build too high without a solid foundation, it's all coming down. After Alexander's unanimity death, uh, I'm sorry, ultimate death, probably due to overexertion, poisoning, or realizing he ran out of the worlds to conquer, his empire couldn't hold itself together. His Greek 
and Macadamia General started playing a high stakes game of risk, maneuvering and fighting until they carved the empire like a holiday turkey. These generals didn't just take over, they rebranded themselves as monarchs, adopting titles and styles reminiscent of the rules of Alexander had defeated. Semi-divine continents with armies collecting bureaucracies, uh, checks and check and check. They were like, if you can't beat them, become them. One standard was Potomi Soto. Soto meaning the savior because humility was scarce in those days. We became the new pharaoh of Egypt. Yes, Macedonian soldier decided, I'm pharaoh now. And everyone just had to go with it. He founded the latest and long line of pharaonic dynasty, which the Romans eventually swept away like unwanted leftovers. These semi-Greek rulers followed Alexander's playbook, founding new cities or giving extreme makeovers to old ones, complete with Greek-style temples and theaters. They created the po pockets of Greek culture in foreign lands, like ancient culture franchise outlets. Everyone wonder why the Afghan city of Canada I'm not pronouncing these things. I'm pronouncing a lot of things wrong. I gotta do better next future videos. I'm really apologize. I hope this is still entertaining. But it sounds oddly familiar. It's a linguistic twist on Alexandria. One of my, uh, many cities Alexander named after himself because branding was important, I guess. The crown jewel was Alexander in Egypt, was Alexander himself founded by upgrading the tiny village. Thanks to Ptolemy, it boasted an ac academy of higher learning. The ancient equivalent of Ivy League University and the most splendid library in the ancient world. Imagine the Library of Congress, but with more scrolls and fewer security checkpoints. Maintaining Greek culture in these exotic, I'm sorry, settings was like trying to keep snowmen from melting in the desert. A bold act of self-assertion. In Alexander, scholars made executive decisions about which works of Greek literature were classics and were, were well, the ancient equivalent of Greek reads. They formed a library canon that Christianity later inherited, shaping a modern view of Greek civilization. It's like they were original influencers deciding what was hot or not. Fast forward to 19, um, fast forward basically, and scholars needed a term for this era of Greek-ish culture. They said on a Hellenistic, which means, sounds fancy and scholarly, differentiating, differentiating it from the OG Greece. While classical Greece and dabbled into democracy when they weren't ostracizing the people who putting philosophers on the, on the trial. The Hellenistic states were more like dictatorship chic. The rulers adopted divine trappings that would make old school Greeks do a double take. Philip II had started this trend of rulers acting like gods, and Alexander took it up to the next level by identifying with multiple Greek and, or, and or, Oriental deities. It's like he was collecting gods like Pokemon. Gotta catch them all. Even with these new monarchs wore the Greek costumes, they hijacked forms of worship previously reserved for Olympian, Olympian gods, talk about culture appropriation. The beloved Gr Greek polis, the city-states that was the heart of Greek identity, never regained its independence. The new Hellenistic cities were exclusive club for elite, similar to how British colonial um, officials later created many Englands in India. These cities coexisted with ancient cultures, leading to awkward interactions a bit like attending a party where they don't understand the customs but still try to mingle. The result was a bit messy blend of repulsion and comprehension and occasional mutual curiosity. Think of it as the world's most complicated potluck dinner where everyone brings a dish but nobody knows what's in it. Political freedom took a backseat, but hey, let's look at the theaters and temples. This new Greek culture had certain genus of ka, or perhaps a whiff of inauthenticity compared to the glory days of classical Athens. 
Maybe that's why there is a slowdown in the creative arts. A strain of um, pessimism seeped into Hellenistic culture, echoing Plato's gloomy view that every day things were mere shadows of reality. Philosophers, realizing that kings weren't returning their ca cause, turned inward to focus on the individual. Some became like cynics, channeling their inner Diogenes of Sinope, who famously lived in the barrel and told Alexander to stop blocking my sunlight. Others, Ahmad uh, Python the Illus, um, who suggested that the best way to live was to make no judgments at all, a philosophy that was so hard to argue with because, well, it refuses to argue. Then there's Epicurus, who championed the pursuit of happiness as life's ultimate goal. His ideal echoed all the way down um, to American Declaration of Independence, actually, although the founding fathers conveniently left out the emphasis on inner tranquility. They were more about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's about chill and joy, simple pleasures. Zeno taught this uh, uh, meaning porch in Greek, giving birth to Stoicism. Stoics aim to conquer their passions and accept life's inevitable miseries without complaint. Basically, the ancient recipe for keeping calm and carrying on. With philosophers turning their backs on worldly affairs, curiosity and practical in innovation took a nosedive. The remarkable advance of classical Greece in technology, medicine, and geog uh, sorry, geography stalled. When someone in Alexander invented a steam engine around 100 years after Jesus was born, people treated it like a novelty toy rather than the industrial revolution starter pack as it was. Why innovative when you were abundant in slave labor? Efficiency was so last century. Yet despite or perhaps because of all of this, the Hellenistic period was, be, was melting pot of ideas. It was a cultural equivalent of a smoothie made from uh, unexpected ingredients that somehow tasted interesting. Greek and Oriental cultures mingled, making it easier for Jewish and non-Theo-Jewish uh, followers of Jesus to pick up and choose the gra grab bag of Greek thought. It was an intellectual uh, buffet for anyone with a moderate education in the Middle East. So while Hellenistic Greece might not have had democratic ideals as its predecessor, it has a stage for significant cultural and philosophical developments. It was a time when rulers thought they were gods, philosophers pondered the meaning of happiness, and libraries were the hottest place in town. And nothing else, it gave us a tale of emperors being told by guys living in barrels, like Diogenes of Sinope, which is a legacy we can all appreciate. Rome and the coming of the Roman Empire is where we're going to go on now, with the world's most ambitious startup. By the time Jesus Christ was born in Palestine, a tiny province on the edge of nowhere, the Hellenistic world was getting a new management from the West, the Romans. These guys didn't bother challenging the cultural superiority of Greeks they found. Instead, they just took over and said, we'll keep this, thanks, unlike Alexander Great's short-lived gig. Their rule lasted for centuries, haunting Christianity like a persistent app notifications. So let's talk about Rome, a city where sense of destiny is so oversized you think was compensating for something else. Uh, Strabo, the Greek historian and ancient equivalent of Google Maps, noted that the Rome had almost nothing going for it. No gold, no spices, and not even a decent olive grove. Their only assets were a knack for war and a sheer stubbornness. Situated in the middle of Italy, they were even on a major trade route. They weren't even on a major trade route. It was like starting a global business from your grandma's basement. And around the mid-8th century BCE, Rome decided to set up Sirius uh, and became a walled city with a king, sort of like upgrabbing from a tent from the house and security system. But in 509 BCE, they kicked out their king faster than a bad date, developing such fear of monarchy that no one dared to take the title king of Romans for the next 1,500 years. That's some commitment to holding a grudge 
What followed was the classical struggle between the haves and the have-nots, the patriarchs, the 1%, the plebeians, everyone else. Unlike in the feel-good movies where the underdog wins, the aristocrats came out on top. They reestablished the republic and influencers of growing government until the empire's end. The plebeians... Uh, got their keep of the popular assemblies, but they had about as much power as a rubber stamp. Real control lay in the consuls, think CEOs, chosen only from the patriarchs and the Senate, a fancy club where the entry was fee was old money and family name. The only hope for the common folk were the tribunes, officials who could veto legislation and considered untouchable during their, their term. Imagine having a friend who can legally say, nope, two bad ideas the whole year. Still in the Roman Republic was no Anthean democracy. It was more like a board meeting where they, the only um, executives get to talk. Rome had an insatiable appetite for expansion, like a kid collecting action figures. Gotta conquer them all. Pokemon again, sorry, joke. A state constantly at war doesn't have time for the messy business of actual democracy, and they were remarkably good at it. While other empires rose and fell faster than fashion trends, Rome stuck around in the West for 1,200 years and East for another 1,000. Talk about longevity. So what was their secret? Unlike the Greeks who considered everyone else barbarians, the early people who go like, bar, 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 I don't know, the Romans were more inclusive. They handed out Roman citizenship like promotional flyers to deserving foreigners, of course. Entire regions were granted citizenship and even slaves could become a citizens through a ceremony or generous will. It was the like ultimate rewards program. The open-minded approach meant more people had a state in Roman success, a stake in Roman success. For, take example, a Jewish tent maker named Paul from his, Czars. He proudly declared Roman citizenship, which came in handy when local authorities got a bit too aggressive. Perhaps the sense of universal citizenship inspired Paul to think that teaching of a certain Jewish prophet was meant for everyone, not just his own people. Rome's expansion was steady and relentless. They must have had contact with Greeks early on, but by the second century BCE, they were eyeing the Greek mainly like a hungry person at a buffet. Their conquest of Greece and the Near East wasn't exactly planned. It was more like they stumbled into a war of a, a king uh, who came out and owned everything. Oops. The irony, the Romans were so captivated by Greek culture that the poetic Horace quipped, Greece, the captive, made her savage victim captive and brought the arts into rustic latium. In other words, Rome conquered Greece militarily, but culturally, Greece conquered Rome. It was like beating someone at a monopoly and then asking them to decorate your house. To make things even weirder, the Romans cooked up the story that they were descended from Athena, a refuge of Troy, the city that the Greeks famously destroyed. So in the poetic tw uh, twist, Troy gets the last laugh over Greece through Rome's success. Sneaky, right? Greek be, be, um, became just as important as Latin in the Roman Empire. It was the lingu linguistic um, of the Eastern Mediterranean, and early uh, Christians often spoke Greek in daily life. By the 6th and 7th centuries, Greek was edging out Latin, the official language of the Eastern Roman Empire, thanks part to the Christian church. Not bad for a culture that was supposedly conquered. But let's get back to politics. The Roman Republic eventually imploded under its own weight. Rising poverty led hunger, general discontent led to several wars around 100 BCE. Enter Julius Caesar, who played the political game like a fiddle, but met an unfortunate end. Um, assassination. <laughs> After more chaos, Caesar's adopted Octavian defeated Mark Anthony, Cleopatra in 31 BCE, at the Battle of Actium, Octavian then rebranded himself in Augustus, meaning the illustrious one, 
which is ancient speak for check out how awesome I am. He was careful not to call himself king. That was a big no-no, but he took on titles like first citizen and commander, the latter giving us the word emperor. Augustus was a master of PR. He maintained the facade that of the old republic and the Senate was still met. Consuls were still elected, but everyone knew exactly who was really pulling the strings. He even took on the role of tribune, endearing himself of the, of the masses. It was like being the CEO, the CFO, and head of HR all at once. Controlling the army was key. Military success was the ultimate badge of honor, so Augustus made sure the highest uh, real was top notch. Even if his actual record was more participation trophy than MVP, MVP. The people didn't mind the shift in power. They were tired of civil wars and just wanted some peace and quiet, which Augustus provided in abundance. He beautifully um, beautified Rome, commissioning grand monumentous um, altar of peace, which was essentially the way of saying you're welcome. The people loved it. Travel became safer, piracy was curbed, and the Mediterranean turned into Rome's private lake. The stability made it easier for Christians to spread there later on, as missionaries could travel relatively unimputed. But not everyone was thrilled. The old aristocracy saw that through Augustus's charade. They missed the Odo days when they could have real power and weren't too keen on worshiping a guy who used to be their peer. Augustus didn't declare himself a god, but he didn't object when people made the offering to his genius, his guided spirit. After his death, he was deified, and subsequent emperors thought, hey, that sounds good, and followed suit. This deification of emperors was a bitter pill um, for the elites. And they had to participate in the imperial cults, blending politics and religion in the ways that made them uncomfortable. It was like being forced to attend a co-worker's self-graduation birthday party every year. Meanwhile, the general populace was cool with all the old gods and the new emperor worship. The Roman pantheon was popular and the imperial cult was just another layer of religious cake. Plus, with an emperor's vast reach, new religious and cults spread like wildfire. The fertility cults from the East Mystery Religions, um, Mithraism, which featured a cosmic battle between the good and evil and many like followers across the empire, amidst all of this, a small Jewish sect emerged, barely noticeable at first. First... The, the, few have, have, the few who could have predicted that this group following a certain Jesus of Nazareth would eventually reshape the religious landscape, their empire, and indeed the world. So there you have it, Rome's rise from nobody, city, to the superpower of the ancient world, setting the stage for the spread of Christianity. It's a tale of ambition, clever branding, and a healthy dose of irony, proof that history can be stranger and funnier than fiction. Israel, now we're going to move on to a tiny land with a huge backstory and more drama than a soap opera. Let's take leisurely, I'm trying to be humorous, I'm sorry if it's not always landing, stroll through the southeastern end of the Mediterranean coast, a land so rich in history and emotion that even naming it can start an argument. Is it Israel? Is it Palestine? Depends on who you ask and whether you're ready for a three-hour debate. For the Jewish people, it's the promised land, a divine real estate deal sealed with the Solomon promises to their forefathers. They called the Jews and the Judah, not the guy who betrayed Jesus, just that was Judas. Originally, the southern part of the land, Christians preferred the Holy Land, because mainly because Jesus was born, did some miracles, and was crucified here. Uh, talk about leaving your mark. Then there is Jerusalem, often called Zion, which is like the VIP lounge in the already exclusive club. It's been there. It's been an apple of everyone's eye. Jews long for it. Christians map the world with it at the center, and the Muslims built one of their most revered shrines there. It's a historical equivalent of the last piece of cake at a party. Everyone wants it, and no one wants to share. Despite its modest size, about 150 miles by 100 miles, smaller than the U.S.'s um, 
smaller than some U.S. counties, the land packs in more geographical quirks than a season of Survivor. The coast, few decent harbors, which is probably why ancient Israelites weren't big on sailing. The sacred texts don't have much love for the sea. It's mostly full of mysteries of cre um, creatures and chaos, kind of like my aunt's cooking in inland. There, there is a fertile plain perfect, but ag agriculture and battles backed by a spine of hills that, that they think they're mountains. Um, Jerusalem sits smack the middle of the hill country, probably enjoying the view and wondering why everyone keeps fighting over it. To the east, hills dramatically drop over the Jordan Valley, featuring the famous Jordan River, a natural border and ancient roads version of Rite of Passage. Crossing it meant you were entering the Promised Land, or at least that's what the brochures up north say. The Jordan feeds into the Sea of Galia, a lake so important that Jesus chose it as its backdrop of many of miracles. Think of it as his personal stage for walking on water and feeding multitudes beats any concert venue today. Down south, the river ends in the Dead Sea, the world's most dramatic dead end. It's so salty that even non-swimmers can float, making it perfect for a spot for people who can, can't decide but beach day and a spa treatment. But let's not forget the desert, deserts to the south and east, because who doesn't love a good sand dune? Rain is a fickle fiend here, friend here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Most of it comes from the west, while winds of the east bring nothing but heat and occasional existential dread. Summers are harsh, and people are spent them praying um, for rain, inventing new ways to stay cool, like sitting under the fig trees and telling epic stories. Now imagine living in a place where water is scarce, neighbors are unfriendly, and a great empire keeps marching through over your backyard. The Israel still to survive here. They built a culture, a religion, and wrote some of the best-selling books. Their sacred texts are full of the tales of Sunday school teachers, love, and kids, and find more interesting than math class. Meet, now we're going to meet the patriarchs, family drama, and ancient edition. Let's start with Abraham, originally named Abr Abram. Until God decided to, uh, he needed rebranding, God promised him that he was the father of a multitude of nations, a big deal considering he was pushing 100 and had no kids. Abraham's grandson Jacob was no angel either. His life was a series of unquestionable decisions and wrestling matches, including one literal all-night grapple with a mysterious stranger who turned into the big God. Plot twist. After that, Jacob got a new name, Israel, meaning he who strives with God. And, and talk about earning a nickname. These stories set the stage for people who are not just followers, but wrestlers with the divine. A relationship more complicated than your last breakup. It's like God and Israel, the most cosmic reality show titled It's Complicated, Chronological Confusion, Other Mysteries. Now, if you're trying to pin these stories on a historical timeline, things get messy faster than a toddler with a sp spaghetti. The big prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, who showed around uh, 8th and 7th centuries BCE, don't mention the patriarchs much of it at all. It's like forgetting to invite your grandparents to your wedding awkward. But there is also um, mentions of Philistines and Armenians, and at times oh, that shouldn't be there, kind of like defining the smartphone is in a Shakespeare play. Scholars scratch their heads over these details, suggesting that some stories may have been retrofitted to make co a cohesive narrative, much like a director's cut that adds scenes for clarity. The exodus from slavery to freedom and lots of wandering is what we're going to go into next. According to the book of Exodus, the Israelites end up in Egypt, stayed there for about 430 years, though the script skips over the those centuries, and then made a dramatic escape thanks to Moses. Fun fact, Moses is an Egyptian name, not Hebrew. Imagine leading a liberation movement with a name like Ramses Jr., the irony writes itself. The Exodus story is full of cinematic moments, plagues, parting seas, and divine um, on Mount Sinai. Uh, 
God gives Moses the Ten Commandments along with a bunch of other laws that would make even the most diligent lawyer reach the coffee. Yet the grand finale entering the promised land gets delayed due to various mishaps including golden calf incidents and general grumblings. Sending down Judges, Kings, and more drama is what we're going to talk about next. And fast forward to the book of Judges and Israel, it's in the promised land. But they can't seem to get their act together. They're ruled by judges, not the courtroom kind, but the leaders who handle both go governance and military defense. It's like combining the roles of president, Supreme Court justice, and the head coach of the national football team. The Philistines, who lent their name to Palestine, are the main antagonists constantly clashing with the Israelites. Think of them as the rival team in sports movie, always showing up in the worst times. Eventually, the people deemed the king to be the all of all nations, despite warnings that kings were downsides, like taxes and conscription. They got Saul, who starts strong but falters. Then David, the shepherd turned uh, giant slayer, who became the archetypal king. David captures Jerusalem, making it the capital, and brings the Ark of the Covenant there, a sacred chest whose contents are as mysterious as the secret formula for Coca-Cola. David's son Solomon takes over the um, and builds the temple in Jerusalem, a grand project that probably had cost overruns and construction delays, but it became the central place of worship. Solomon was known for his wisdom, wealth, and a rather large number of wives and concubines. 700 wives and 300 concubines, to be exact, meaning that household must have been a logistical nightmare. A kingdom divided and prophets galore after Solomon's death, the kingdom splits into Israel, north, and Judah in the south. A bit like a band breaking up over creative differences. They sometimes fought each other, which didn't help um, external threats loom when loomed. Enter the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and others who acted as a, a conscience of the nation. They warned the people about the consequences of their actions, calling out kings and com commoners alike. Imagine having a friend who constantly tells you that your life choices are terrible, but in a poetic verse. These prophets were fortune tellers uh, gazing into crystal balls. They were more like social critics, highlighting the injustice and urging a return to proper worship of Yahweh. They weren't always popular. No one likes a party pooper, but their messages became central to Jewish thought. Exile and return, a cliffhanger ending. The northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians in 722 BCE, and its people were scattered, a historical dislike button, if ever, ever, if ever there was one. Judah held out a bit longer, but eventually fell to the Babylonians of 586 BCE, the temple was destroyed, and many exiled to Babylon. In Babylon, the Jewish people had to grapple with maintaining their identity in a foreign land. They compiled and edited their sacred texts, possibly adding stories like the patriarchs were mentioned earlier. It's like they used the downtime to work in the group project that they would define their culture of millennia. When the Persian king Cyrus, the great conqueror of Babylon, he allowed the exiles to return to home, not everyone did. Some probably thought, you know, Babylon isn't so bad, once you get used to it. But those who returned rebuilt the temple and the second temple and tried to restore the community, setting the stage for future events that would shape not only Judaism, but the Christianity and Islam, wrapping up more than just history lesson. So there you have it, a land so small in size, but enormous in significance with a history richer than a triple chocolate cake. Former patriarchs with name changes and wrestling matches to to kings of prophets to exile and return the story was anything but dull this tiny piece of real estate has been a crossroads of empires the focus of the divine promises and the backdrop for stories that have misshaped the world it's a place where geograph geography i'm sorry ge geography meets theology where every hill valley could tell a tale if rocks could talk but if they did they'd probably start an argument about who was there first in the end, the land we call Israel or Palestine or the Holy Land is that is more to a testament to human resilience and to the enduring power of stories. And perhaps the biggest takeaway is despite thousands of years of conflict and change and the questions and challenges faced by its people are remarkably similar to those we have grappled with today. History doesn't just repeat itself. 
It also chuckles knowingly, waiting for a catch up. The ex exile and after when coming home gets complicated. So picture this, the Jewish people have just experienced the Babylonian exile, a forced vacation that no one wanted and everyone hated. hated. And the exile lasted more than half a century. They might have settled into Babylon life, opened up some falafel, sh falafel shops, um, and forgotten all about Jerusalem, but as fate would have it, they got to the screen light to return some rebuild the, um, the temple, which they did by 516 BCE. Cue the grand fee opening of the confetti, maybe a camel parade. But hold on, there's a plot twist. They couldn't reinstate the monarchy because, well, the Persian under the kings were now the landlords, and they weren't keen on the local kings popping up. So the temple... Um, and his priesthood became the new big shots, the spiritual CEOs of Jewish identity for the next 500 years. Imagine your local church also running for government, schools, and maybe the best deli in town. Now you think everyone would be hugging and high-fiving upon return, but nope. They returning exiles were like the snooty cousin who went abroad for that semester and came back with an accent. They accepted help with their buddies still, chilling in Babylon, but gave the cold shoulder to the locals who had stayed behind. The locals were dubbed the, be the people um, of the land, which is ancient Hebrew for you guys who didn't work cool enough to sit down with us. The exiles felt like these folks hadn't, hadn't suffered enough, you know, no exile, no exotic Babylonian uh, selfies, so they couldn't possibly understand true Jewish identity. Feeling snubbed, some of these locals built a rival temple on mount on a different mount in uh samaria entering the samaria samaritans who according to the returning jews were like the knockoff brands of the religious world centuries later jesus would tell the parable the the good samaritan flipping over the script making a samaritan the hero talk about a plot development meanwhile back in babylon the jews who didn't return were uh, contributing to every growing collection of sacred writings they might have borrowed a few stories from their neighbors, like the flood narr narrative, especially similar to the Epic of Gigamesh, and woven them into their own lore. They also started pondering big questions like, why did God let our city get sacked? Uh, one theory introduced a cosmic troublemaker, the adversary of uh, Satan. He starts a minor character, but eventually he starts off as a minor character in in the book of Job, but gets a pro uh, promotion with the main villain, Satan, in later writings, especially in Christian texts of the book of Revelation. It's the ancient equivalent of blaming their intern for all the false, uh, office mishaps. But not everyone was on board with the scapegoating. Some felt like the question in God's plan was above their pay grade. Enter the book of Job, a poetic exploration of suffering where Job loses everything but still refuses to curse God. His friends offer the worst part, pep talk ever, and in the end, God basically says, I'm God, you're not, any questions, it's like the ultimate, because I said so, from a divine parent. Then there's the Quileth, better known as Escaladius, um, who takes existential dread to new levels. His catchphrase, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Translation, everything is pointless, so why bother? So here's the guy at the party who reminds you that this universe is expanding, nothingness, just a year of reacting, another cocktail weenie. On the flip side, some writings were more upbeat, like the book of Proverbs offering nuggets of wisdom. Um, then your grandma might have needlepoint in a pillow. A soft answer turns wrath and helpful tips for surviving awkward family dinners. Realizing they needed to tighten up their community guidelines, Jewish leaders doubled down on laws and rituals. They revisited uh, Deuteronomy Code, emphasizing strict obedience to God's commands. It was like updating the terms and conditions, but the time of the people actually read them. Well, sort of. Interestingly, Judaism started opening its doors to converts, known as uh, yeah, converts. All you had to do was embrace Jewish customs, including circumcision. Yes, adult circumcision. Talk about your commitment. This move 
hinted the universal concept that Christianity and Islam would later run with. Meanwhile, the world wasn't, it kept spinning, it did keep spinning, I'm sorry, and the new challenges arose. The Greeks showed up bringing philosophy, gym memberships, and language that silent letters everywhere. When Alexander the Great's empire fragmented, the empire, the, another empire took over. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> and uh, things got dicey under King uh, Antiochus IV um, of the Ephesians, whose name literally meant God manifests, modest guy, not really. He tried to Hellenize the Jewish Jews by force, desecrating the temple of outlawing Jewish practices. This led to the Macedonian Revolt in 167 BC, a grassroots movement led by Judas Maccabus and his brothers, Mac and think Braveheart, but with more beards and fewer kilts. Against all odds, they conceded and the temple was re rededicated. This event is celebrated through Hanukkah, the festival of lights, commemorating the miracles of days worth of lasting eight days. It's the ancient world's version of your phone's batteries surviving at 1% all day. The, another dynasty emerged from this revolt, giving the Jews a century um, semi autonomous rule, autonomous rule. They expanded territories, minted coins, and probably ar argued about taxes, typically government stuff. However, internal conflicts, external pressures made it a roller coaster of a dynasty. During this period, Jewish communities flourished not in Palestine, but all around the Mediterranean. They set up synagogues, which were more just places of worship. They were community centers of schools, original networking hubs. The emphasis on reading and interrupting scripture led to the need for standardized collection of sacred texts. Enter the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, consisting of the laws and prophets, the writings, and it's like organizing a bookshelf into fiction, nonfiction, and other stuff. Not all texts made the cut, though. Some were regulated into the Apocrypha, a collection of writings considered valuable but not canonical. It's like the bonus tracks of the deluxe album, interesting but not part of the main set list. Christians later debated these texts, with Protestants eventually excluding them um, during the Reformation. Meanwhile, other writings known as the pseudographia uh, float around, fueled the apoptical versions attributed to famous figures like Enoch or um, others. These were the ancient equivalent of fan fiction, creative and intriguing, but not officially endorsed. In Alexandria, a massive Jewish library thrived. These Hellenistic Jews spoke Greek, produced the um, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible scriptures. Um, legend has it that 72 scholars translated these, these texts in 72 days, a record that would make modern um, translators weep with envy. Uh, they became crucial for the Jews and, uh, and later for the early Christians, who quoted it extensively. Jewish philosophy first, like Philo of Alexandria, blended Jewish theology with Greek philosophy using alleged allegory to interpret scriptures. He tried to make Judaism intellectually respectable to the Greco-Roman world, like trying to explain your favorite sci-fi show using the highbrow library criticism. Concepts of this immorality of the soul and the afterlife gained more traction during this period, influenced by Greek thought and the harsh realities of persecution. Uh, martyrdom during these events of the Macron revolt led to reflections of justice, Reward beyond its life. If good people suffer and, and die unjustly, there might be a cosmic compensation plan, right? The Romans entered the scene, conquering Judah in 63 BC. They installed the Herod the Great as a client king, but projects under this tendency to um, eliminate family members he found threatening. He re re renovated the Second Temple, turning it into a wonder um, of the ancient world but also built a pagan temple, which didn't win any popularity contest in the Jews. After Herod's death, the kingdom was divided among his sons, leading to confusion and dissatisfaction. Roman perfects, like the infamous Pontius Pilate, took over the administration controlling Jewish society that became fragmented into various sects. Sadducees, the priestly 
um, elite who ran the temple and struck into the written law. They didn't believe in resurrection or angels making them the skeptics of the day. Pharisees advocate strict adherence to the law and oral, oral, oral traditions. They believe in resurrection, angels, and were the predecessors of rabbinic Judaism. And then there's Essence, a, a monastic group that lived in the desert, possibly responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Think of them as the hermits that penchant for the meticulous record keeping. And the Zealots, the radical anti Roman activists who believed in taking up arms to fight God's deliverance. They were the fight now and questions later crowd. Amidst this tapestry, a new movement emerged around a Galilee preacher named Jesus of Nazareth. His teachings, attracted followers who saw him as the promised Messiah. After his crucifixion, his followers proclaimed his resurrection, eventually forming a distinct group that came to the known as Christians. They reinterpreted Jewish scriptures, supported their beliefs, like finding hidden messages in the well-loved novel. So from exile and return to the revolt and occupation, the Jewish people navigated a complex historical landscape. They adapted, refunded their identity, and contributed profoundly to religious thought. Their experience set the stage not just for the development of rabbinic, rabbinic Judaism, but for the development of the emergence of Christianity and later Islam. In the grand narrative of history, this small nation had an outsized impact, pro proving that the sometimes the most compelling stories came from the most unexpected places. And that's the tale of the exile and after filled with drama, resilience, and a cast of characters that would make an epic saga jealous. And there you have it, a roller coaster ride through the wild and wacky world of ancient history, complete with gods behaving badly, empires and egos bigger than their territories, and a tiny nation that uh, punched at way above its weight class. From Zeus's dysfunctional family reunions to Rome's aggressive startup tactics, we've seen how the threads of different cultures wove together the tapestry of Western civilization. Hopefully, you've laughed at the Greeks. Pension, public nudity in the sports um, joke that I told earlier, marveled at the Alexander uh, Great's world tour of conquest and ego, and winced at Rome's relentless expansion of powered combination of military might and clever citizenship incentives. We've also journeyed through the sands of Israel, a land through the stories who have retold millennia and whose impact, impact is still today. If you have watched this whole video, I'm hoping to get better over time. I'm really sorry about that. I, a lot of words I didn't know how to pronounce. I apologize, but um, yeah, so that's me trying to um, paraphrase and add some jokes to Christianity the first 3,000 years, um, which is a book I read, which is over a thousand pages. And that's just like the beginning chapters. Um, I just thought that it was really interesting and want to share it in my own unique way. Uh, adding some humor as well to make it more interesting. And again, sorry for pronunciations. And I, I don't know, I guess like unseen. Thank you.